was not born and raised Catholic. I converted to Catholicism when I was 31 years old. And when people find out that I converted, um, there is one question that they will always ask me. And that question is, what teaching of the Catholic Church was the most difficult for you to understand or to accept as a non-Catholic Christian coming into full communion with the Catholic Church? What was that one question? Well, I think they are expecting me to answer the question like this. I had a difficult time understanding and accepting purgatory. Or, I had a difficult time understanding why I needed to confess my sins to a priest. Or, I had a difficult time understanding why Catholics pray to saints. Uh, because at best, that seems like you're trying to conjure the dead. And at worst, it seems like you are committing some sort of sacrilege, violating what St. Paul says about putting only more than one mediator between you and God. But the most common thing they expect me to say is that when I was converting, they expect me to say that I had a difficult time accepting the, teach the church's teachings on the Blessed Mother. Well, the fact of the matter is I didn't have a difficult time with any of those teachings whatsoever. When I was converting, I didn't know the fullness of the church's dogma and doctrine. But once they were presented to me and once they were explained, I had no problems getting my head and my heart around those teachings. Um, in fact, it helped make Christianity make more sense to me because as I was progressing through my non-Catholic life, um, there were some holes that I just didn't think were being answered well enough in that non-Catholic experience. And so it wasn't until I came into the church and was learning more about what the church teaches and her history and how she worships that some of those holes were filled and those bridges were gapped. No, the one thing that I had the most difficult time understanding when I was converting was the word that starts with an L. Now for you Catholics, what word starts with an L in our faith that you encounter every week at least, if not every day? You got it. <laughs> Liturgy. I had the hardest time getting my mind around that concept. And the reason for that is because in my non-Catholic Protestant background, we were a non-liturgical church. So I had never heard the word liturgy before in my life. And as I was converting and coming into the church and learning more about the church, I could see that liturgy caused a lot of conflict within the church. You know, people have very specific ideas as to how the liturgy is to take place. Very specific ideas. So not only did I just not understand the word to begin with, and certainly didn't understand why there was so argumentation about liturgy itself, that was by far the hardest thing for me to kind of grasp. And now here I am, not only celebrating the liturgy, but trying to explain it to each of you. So <laughs> um, I am not sure if I can ever get my head around the mystery that takes place at the liturgy at every single Catholic Mass. But I do know that I can get my heart around it. Because what happens at the Mass has literally taken my entire life to be a part of. What happens at the Mass gives direction to my life. So when you go into a new surrounding, you know, you try to find your bearings, and you do so by figuring out where north is and where south and east and west is. And whenever I come into a new place, the first thing I want to be aware of is where are the tabernacles in this place? So as I'm standing here right now, I know I have our Lord in the tabernacle right behind me. I know there's one at St. Anne's. I know there's one at the cathedral. I know there's one at St. Philomena's. I know there's one at St. Vincent de Paul's. Because the Eucharist has become that thing that centers me and gives me my entire direction. And this is exactly what happens in the Mass itself. So back to that word, liturgy. In its simplest definition, liturgy is the way that we worship. And that's what we'll be doing here in about 30 minutes, thank God. Let me go back, though, 
to my conversion and talk about the Blessed Mother. You know as well as I do that many non-Catholics are convinced that as Catholics, we worship the Virgin Mary. And maybe here is why they think that. Protestants are like us Catholics in many ways. We worship the one true God, subsisting in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Protestants are like us Catholics because the primary day of our worship is Sunday, the Lord's Day, the day that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So if you put yourself in a Protestant mind and ask yourself, what does it mean to worship? Here's an answer that you might get. To worship means to sing songs about Jesus Christ because he is the object of our worship. To worship means to pray to Jesus Christ because he is the one we worship. To worship means to listen to a sermon about Jesus Christ because he is the one we worship. So if that's the mindset when a Protestant comes into a Catholic church gathering on the Lord's Day and if they see us singing songs about Mary, praying to Mary, listening to a sermon about Mary, what do you think the Protestant concludes? Ah, oh, they worship Mary. You worship Mary because you sing songs about her, you pray to her, and you listen to a sermon about her. And that's worship. As a Catholic, how do you respond to that sort of statement? And I hope you have an answer. Here's how I respond. And sometimes my responses get a little snarky, especially when, when they're with my close friends or with my family members. But I say, well, since when is any of that worship? And I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but maybe if you read the Bible a little more carefully, you'd be able to see exactly what worship is, because God tells us very specifically how to worship. He gives us liturgy. And in its simplest terms, worship demands sacrifice. God makes that very clear from the moment he enters into a covenant with the people of Israel. And he does this with Moses. Worship is about sacrifice. So tell me what you know about Moses. Raise your hand, yell it out. <laughs> Moses. Ten Commandments, yep, yep. Where do we first see Moses? Basket down the mountain. Yeah, floating amongst the bulrushes, yeah. And then he's taken in by the Egyptians. And then he's raised by Pharaoh's daughters. And then eventually, what happens to him? Well, what does God ask him to do? Free the slaves. Free his people, yeah, free. Because the children of Israel, which they're not known as the children of Israel yet, they're not even known as Jews yet, they're just Hebrews. They have been taken into slavery by the Egyptians. So Moses is asked to lead them. So you remember that Moses is trying to negotiate his way out of Egypt into the promised land, and he's having a hard time doing that. And so God says, oh, I'm going to give some, I'm going to apply some pressure to the Egyptians. So he starts casting the plagues on the Egyptians. And the tenth plague that is cast is what? Killing up firstborn. Yes, yes. Um, the angel of death is commanded to kill the firstborn of every family, except if, what is the protection that God provides? Yeah, yeah, you have to sacrifice this lamb and place the lamb on your door, on the threshold of the door. And if that is found on the evening of this tenth plague, then the angel of death will pass over that home and you'll be saved. Now, so this becomes known as the Passover, and the Jews are commanded to do it every single year for as long as the world exists. So, Passover. Um, there is something else. So, they, they make their way out of Egypt. Uh, they're enter, beginning to enter into the Promised Land. They're going to take some turns, though, before they get there. And they finally come to Mount Sinai, and what does Moses do on Mount Sinai? Yeah, he comes down with the Ten Commandments because he was able to speak with God. 
Now, I think probably most of us have this Charleston Heston, Charlton? Charleston yeah. Heston view of um, Moses and the Ten Commandments. That, okay, he came down with these two tablets, and there's three commandments written on this side, and there's um, seven written on the other side. Um, but in fact, Moses came down with the entire Jewish law, not just the Ten Commandments. He came down with the entire Jewish law. And he had spent 40 days on the top of this mountain, surrounded by darkness and thunder and light. And the children of Israel are at the base of this mountain. So when Moses finally comes down, they are anxious to know what God has said. And Moses' response to them is, we will do everything that God has asked us to do. And so this is what Moses immediately does. He builds an altar. He erects 12 pillars around this altar. He goes into the herd and selects bulls. He offers the bulls as a sacrifice. He takes that blood. He sprinkles the blood all over the altar, all over the pillars that are erected and among the people themselves. And this becomes the world's first liturgy. The first public act of worship for the people of God according to the law of God. And what does that worship show us? Well, it shows us several things. It shows us that worship is not about the music, how good it is, how bad it is, how Latin it is, how WCIC it is. <laughs> Worship is not about the sermon, how inspiring it is or how uninspiring it is. Worship isn't about being a welcoming community where we go around and shake everybody's hands and kiss all the babies. Nobody's running for office. Now, all of those things are important, and they can certainly be a part of but the single most defining characteristic of worship is one thing and one thing only. The worship of the God of Israel is about sacrifice. Period. So sacrifice is what creates this covenant between man and God. It creates the relationship between God um, and the people of Israel. And eventually this covenant keeps getting expanded and span expanded until our Lord comes and potentially includes the entire world. Moses sprinkles the blood of the sacrifice on the people, and from this moment on, the lives of the chosen people will center around this system of sacrifice. A priesthood will be commanded by God to keep this sacrifice in place. Now, how many of you would say you're, uh, when it comes to the Old Testament and the New Testament, who is more familiar with the New Testament than the Old Testament? Yeah, I would say most Christians, for most of us Christians, that's exactly the case. We spend a lot of time with the New Testament. One, the New Testament is shorter. Two, the New Testament tends to be a little more chronological, so you can figure things out a little easier. Well, when I was, um, this was even before I was baptized, actually, in trying to make sense of the Bible, I really found the Old Testament to be... Um, pretty cumbersome. I could never really just sit down and open up the Old Testament and figure out where I was. And part of that is because of the way the Old Testament is arranged. It's not necessarily arranged chronologically. Plus, some of the books in the Old Testament span 300 years. Um, some of these books overlap. So the Old Testament was always a real source of confusion for me. So I made an effort to try to figure out the Old Testament. I bought one of those um, uh, Old Testament book for dummies, which was a great help. Um, when I was in seminary, I took as many Old Testament classes as I possibly could. But one of the things uh, that I've found most helpful is whenever I study the Old Testament for my own uh, spiritual growth or knowledge, um, I tend to turn to the rabbis. I prefer Jewish scholarship on the Old Testament. One, as a practical reason, there, isn't, there really just isn't a lot of Christian scholarship on the Old Testament because our concern and our focus is predominantly the New Testament. And when we do look at the Old Testament, we often look for those signs and figures that point to Christ himself. Um, but I also find a, greater, a great depth when it comes to Jewish research and scholarship on the Old Testament. 
So I, I'm bringing this up because I'm going to be talking about the Jewish mystics for a little bit as it relates to the altar of sacrifice. But one of the things that I've learned about the Jewish mystics, and so this will kind of give you, uh, maybe be able to anticipate what kind of answer they give when it comes to talking about the temple and the altar of sacrifice. The Jewish mystics, they, uh, uh, so, so this is probably the 1400s, the 1500s. Isaac Luria is one of the predominant voices of the Jewish mystics. And he talks about the Sabbath. You know, there's so much in Judaism that even Jews don't know. So they try, the Jewish mystics try to make sense out of this. So you know the Sabbath begins on what night? Friday night. It begins on Friday night and it ends on Saturday night. It begins Friday night when there are three visible stars in the sky and it ends Saturday night when there are three visible stars in the sky. Well, the Sabbath experience for Jews is very sensual. They have a lot of ritual going on. And plus, at the end of the Sabbath, so this is Saturday night at dusk, one of the rituals that they do is, it's called the Havdalah. And during this little ceremony, it marks the end of the Sabbath, and they take, um, there's a little spice box. They sit together as a family or uh, some sort of congregational gathering. They have this little spice box. It's filled with these spices, and they pass this spice box around. And everybody smells the spices, so you get the sense, um, the, the, the odor of the Sabbath in your head, in your body. The other thing that they do is they light this multi-wicked candle. Um, and then once the candle is lit, they sing a song about Elijah, because Elijah proclaims the coming of the Messiah. But the last thing they do is once the spices have been smelled and the candle has been lit, they take their hand and they hold their hand up to the candle and they look at their fingernails. Now, if you were to ask an Orthodox Jew why on earth they do that, here's the answer that they would tell you. We have absolutely no idea why we do it. <laughs> but we've been doing it for centuries and centuries and centuries. So that's why we do it. So the Jewish mystics come along and they try to come up with an answer. And they say, well, when Adam and Eve were created in the garden, they were covered with this nail stuff. From head to toe, we were, humankind was covered with this nail stuff. It was like a sort of protection for us out in nature. So in the way that a bear has thick fur for his protection, or a fish has, uh, has scales, or a porcupine has quills. We have this nail stump all over us. Well, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and they fell, this nail stump fell off of us. So we became vulnerable. And this is what King David sings about in the Psalms, that all flesh is weak. But God left us with a reminder of the Garden of Eden by putting the finger, leaving the fingernails on our hands and on our feet. And they end the Sabbath that way so that when you go out into your work week, no matter where your feet take you, or no matter what you do with your hands, you have the protection of God. That in spite of our disobedience, he's not going to leave us or forget us. In fact, he's going to expand himself around that by bringing us into the covenant, which starts with Moses and then gets fulfilled in Jesus Christ himself. So this is kind of the Jewish mystical explanation. It gives you kind of a sense of where the Jewish mystics are coming from. And so the reason why I bring this up is because the Jewish mystics then are trying to make sense out of this Old Testament system of sacrifice. What was the purpose of the temple? What was the purpose of the altar? Why are there so many specific rules about what needs to be sacrificed and when it needs to be sacrificed and how that sacrifice is supposed to be carried out? What was this all about? Well, the answer that they give is that Jews truly saw the temple as a place where heaven and earth can meet. And the most specific place where they could meet would be in the Holy of Holies. And even more specifically than that was the altar of sacrifice. So the Jewish mystics say that they saw the Old Testament uh, altar as being a sort of cosmic transportation system. 
that what is placed upon the altar will eventually find its way to God. And the reason why Leviticus goes through all of these very specific rules about what should be sacrificed and so on is because not that God wanted creation destroyed. The sacrificial system was not seen as a way of, de of, of, of something as destruction, but it was, a seen, it was seen as a way of restoration. So if you placed a dove upon the altar and that dove was taken up as a sacrifice, the entire nature of doves was sanctified by God because of this relationship that existed between the altar of heaven and the altar of earth. And you can see this then coming to play in Christianity, that we don't lose that sense of sacrifice and that sense of connection between heaven and earth. In fact, Jesus Christ makes it even more specific. So, if this is the Jewish sense that what is placed upon the altar eventually finds its way to God and becomes holy because of it, then you can imagine that Jesus Christ, when he is upon the altar of the cross, is offered to God finds his way there. Also, if we place our lives and our heart upon the altar of sacrifice, which is what every single one of us should be doing when we're going to Mass, placing our life on the altar with Christ, our life too will ultimately find its way to heaven and be sanctified by it. So when I found that, when I uh, kind of explored the Jewish mystics, um, they give a great depth, not only to the Old Testament itself, but also to Christianity itself. That helps me make sense out of the Mass and give it greater depth. So, when it comes to this concept of sacrifice, which is the single defining definition for worship in the Old Testament, we see it getting carried through to the New Testament. What that means is, what you should find at Mass is exactly that concept. Now we move into the New Testament, and I'll get into a little more of this detail a little bit later. Um, but when Jesus, at the Last Supper, takes bread and blesses it and proclaims it as his body, and then he takes the chalice, he blesses it and proclaims it as his blood, he commands the apostles to perpetuate this action because in so doing, he perpetuates the sacrifice, which is the heart of worship. And that sacrifice isn't brought to a bloody end, but it's rejuvenated to its life-giving beginning in the New Testament. So, if there is no bread that is the body of Christ, and if there is no blood that is, or wine that is the blood of Christ, then there is no sacrificial lamb upon our altar. And if there is no lamb upon our altar, then there is no sacrifice. And if there is no sacrifice, then there is no worship in continuity with what was revealed to Moses on the top of Mount Sinai. So if someone comes to me and says, oh, you Catholics worship Mary, this is what I say. Yep. I sing songs about Mary. Yep. I pray to Mary. Yep. I listen to and preach sermons about Mary. But as far as worship, don't forget the Jewish roots of our Christian faith because worship is about sacrifice. It has been from the very beginning and the only sacrifice that is acceptable to God is the sacrifice of his only begotten son. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if you come to Mass, then you would be able to participate in that sacrifice, which is offered to Mary? No. Offered to St. John Paul II? No. Offered to St. Benedict? No. It's offered to the one who we worship, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is how every Mass always begins. And when it comes time for the Mass, then when we, when we get to the Eucharistic prayer, you can just follow the pronouns, follow the antecedents, and you can see that it's always offered to the Father. Okay. 
I'd like to tell you one last thing about my conversion. When I was in uh, law school, my roommate was Jewish. And he had a very interesting life story. He was born and raised in the Soviet Union. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, his family came to the United States. So after one of our classes, we uh, grabbed a bite to eat at some diner. And he was eating his mashed potatoes. Um, and after his first bite, he took off his napkin and he immediately spit it all out. And he said, oh, there's bacon bits in these mashed potatoes. And I said, well, I'll, I'll take them. I'm not Jewish. You know, it's, it's, it's kosher. So we started talking about religion. And I wasn't Catholic at this point. In fact, I had just been baptized in the Apostolic Christian Church, which I was born and raised as an Apostolic Christian. Maybe some of you are a little familiar with them. But ACs, as they're commonly called, are kind of from the Amish and Mennonite tradition. So theologically, that's we were the same theologically. So I had just been baptized as an apostolic Christian, and he saw that I took my faith pretty seriously. He saw me pray regularly, he saw me read my Bible, and he started asking me about the church that I go to, so I gave him a little background, told him. So he listened very patiently, and he finally said, look, I, I really don't know very much about Christianity, but I have been to Christian churches before. And he said, is, is Christianity supposed to be the fulfillment of Judaism? And I thought about it, and I said, yeah, I, I would say that that's how we perceive it. And he said, well, here's what I, as a Jew, don't understand. He said, I've been to a number of Christian churches, but it doesn't seem anything like Judaism to me. But he said, I got my bachelor's degree at Loyola University in Chicago, and um, he said the funny, so he had been to Mass several times. And he said the funny thing is that I could see my Judaism at Mass. I could hear my Judaism at Mass. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, when I've been to like a mega church or some non-denominational Bible church, he said, I don't mean to be offensive, but he said, it really does come across to me as some sort of conference or a lecture or maybe in some situations even kind of a pop concert. And again, he said, I don't mean to be critical, but it was just all very foreign to me as a Jew. But he said, something felt more familiar to me when I was at the Catholic church and watching the mass. So I was getting very interested in, in what he was saying, and I said, well, explain that some more. And he said, well, you know, every year, I, as a Jew, celebrate the Seder, which is the Passover. And he says, this is what I hear the rabbi say when we celebrate the Seder. The rabbi takes bread, and he says, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he said, this is what I heard the Catholic priest say he took bread and he said blessed are you Lord God of all creation for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer fruit of the earth the work of human hands it will become for us the bread of life and my roommate said at the Seder the rabbi he takes a glass of wine and he holds the wine up and he says blessed are you O Lord our God king of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine this is what he heard the priest say at Mass. He takes wine, and he says, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. And then he just stopped there, and he looked at me, and he said, You know, if I were you, I, if, I, I could never imagine leaving my Judaism, but if I had to leave my Judaism, I'd be Catholic. <laughs> And really, it was that comment that kind of set me on track to learning more about the Old Testament and the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. And that necessarily led me into the Catholic Church. First time I went to Mass was when I was 18 years old. And I went out of curiosity. I had no idea what to expect. And my heart was actually pounding because I was sure that the good God was going to strike me dead because I'm just a good little Swiss German AC boy and here I was surrounded by all of these idolatrous Catholics. <laughs> Everything was foreign to me. 
And I didn't know what was going on at all until I saw the priest hold the bread and wine um, that he just spent time praying over. I saw him hold that up in the air and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. And I don't know how to describe it, but it was a moment of real clarity for me. I remember thinking to myself, oh, that is Jesus Christ. That's what all of this was about. Um, the whole thing was entirely centered on that moment right there. So all of the um, crazy sign language stuff that I saw the little old lady standing next to me doing, making the sign of the cross, so she was actually like making a sign of the cross on her head and on her mouth and on her heart. I didn't know what she was doing. All of the genuflecting, all of the responses that I didn't know where they were getting these responses from, how did they, how did they know this? It was all centered on that moment, the consecrated bread and wine being the body and blood of Jesus Christ, being the sacrificial lamb upon the altar. You know, when we go to Mass physically, the church wants to take us to several spaces spiritually. Physically, we go to church, but spiritually, if we truly want to enter into the Mass, the Mass will take us to about four different places. First of all, it will take us to the temple in Jerusalem, where we find the Holy of Holies and the altar of sacrifice. So all the sacrificial aspects of the Old Testament are fulfilled at the Mass. Next place the church will take us to during the Mass is the upper room in Jerusalem, because this is where Jesus institutes the Eucharist. He gives us the new elements of bread and wine that we are to use in this sacrifice. The third place, the Mass will take us to the Mount of Calvary, where Jesus, the Lamb of God, is crucified upon the cross. And lastly, the church will take us to heaven, as it's revealed to us in the book of Revelation. And I won't go into all of the detail, but there is a pattern, certainly, what you see at the sanctuary of the Catholic Church and the description that we see of heaven in the book of Revelation. So four places the church wants to take us during Mass. So let's start going. And I'll do that by showing you how I get ready for Mass. Well, before I start messing, um, when you come, it just very basic things. When you come into a Catholic church and uh, get ready for Mass, what is the first thing that you do? Yeah, you look for the holy water. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of funny whenever I, got, I am at a, a parish, no matter what parish I am, if the holy water thing gets moved, you can see people immediately looking around for what's <laughs> um, Why? Why do we do that? Exactly. It's a reminder of our baptismal promises. So if you haven't been baptized, there's really no need to uh, use the holy water. It's not wrong if you do, but it is for the baptized, and it's a reminder of our baptismal promises that we make. So our baptism gets renewed. Uh, it should be renewed every time we enter into the Catholic Church with that holy water. There is also a Jewish reason why we have holy water. And do you know why? What, from Judaism, uh, what, what, what do, did Jews used to do, and what do they still do? Ceremonial washing, yeah. So in the Jewish temple, there were these big, um, they were called mikvahs, like pools. And before you enter the temple, you would have to enter into these pools. And then Orthodox Jews um, still have this concept of mikvahs, these uh, 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 ritual cleansings that they use. And so this is also kind of a carryover for us Catholics um, from our Jewish roots. Okay, so you have the holy water, you make the sign of the cross, and then what is the next thing? Yeah, yeah. You you walk into the church and you see who is taking your seat and you go to the <laughs> this is this is why communism will never work. All you have to do is look into a Catholic church because you know communism is oh there's no private property. Well I assure you, people have their views. They don't own it, they have their private property. So you go into you genuflect and you go into your pew. Now before mass starts, what is the most important thing in the sanctuary before mass starts? The tabernacle, exactly right. 
So no matter where the tabernacle is in the church, most often it's in the sanctuary, but sometimes you really have to look. Um, wherever that tabernacle is, that's where you will genuflect toward. However, that changes the minute the priest says, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, when the priest does that, what becomes the most important thing in the sanctuary? The altar, yeah. So just as if, if any of you are having to do altar server training um, in, in your uh, teaching profession, um, once mass starts, you know, you see the little altar servers come and they're setting up the, the altar, um, it would be most correct if they would bow to the altar once mass starts. Before mass, they should be genuflecting or bowing toward the tent. Just a little bit. But sometimes you see people do two different things during mass. One's bowing to the altar and the other is bowing to toward the tent. I'm not sure why. That's right. Okay, so you go into your pew and after you genuflect and you pray, waiting for mass, what is the thing that you should be praying for? What, what, what should you be doing in that moment of silence as you are preparing your heart for mass itself? What should you be doing? say that they don't get a lot out of mass, I mean, I think there's a lot of problems with that statement in general. It says a lot about maybe where they're at spiritually. Um, but I think it's because your intention for being there isn't very clear yet in your mind or in your heart. It might be clear in your body. The habit is to go to mass on Sunday because you're supposed to go to mass, but God wants all of us. He doesn't want just our body. He wants our heart and our mind. So when you are preparing for Mass, prepare that intention. In about 20 or 30 minutes, the master of the universe is going to be in this cosmic transportation system and will be held up for our, for our adoration. Have something to say to him. So maybe when you form your intention, you are praying for your best friend who is just diagnosed with cancer. Or you are praying for your brother or sister who is having a difficult time in their marriage and their marriage is falling apart. Or you have a, a, a moment of graciousness for the blessing, a particular blessing you've been given throughout that week. Just have some intention that you can form during that Mass. Because not only are you forming that intention, but the priest is certainly forming his intention as well. We have both a public intention that we will state and announce to the congregation, and then we'll also have our own private intentions that we have. But having that intention helps keep us focused, first of all. And secondly, you are participating in the Mass as well. I mean, this isn't like a passive situation. You're not here just to, to listen to somebody talk or you know, hear some music that doesn't necessarily seem very uplifting to you. You're there to participate in the sacrifice. This is part of your baptismal priesthood. So have that intention to lay upon the altar so that it too can be taken to heaven. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and get vested for mass. Um, these are very simple vestments. There's nothing very fancy about them. Obviously, you've probably seen some much fancier ones. But since we're wearing like seven layers of clothes, I sweat a lot. So I like to wear as light of vestments as I possibly can. Almost everything that we do in the church has both a practical reason and a spiritual reason to it. And this is, the, this is true also for the vestments that we wear. So not all priests wear this, many do, um, but this is what's called, this is one of the first things that we put on, and this is called an amice. So the practical reason uh, or purpose for the amice is uh, to protect the vestments from our sweat, because vestments can be very expensive. <laughs> As cheap as this one is, this is still a couple hundred bucks. So you can imagine some of the really nice vestments get up into the couple thousand bucks. So the amethyst, as a practical matter, is just to protect the vestment itself from, from sweat. Also, from history, uh, Greeks and Roman warriors used to wear this. This is what they call the amethyst. Um, the amethyst is actually a head covering. So the warriors and the soldiers would put this over their head and then they'd put the helmet on top of their head to prevent the sweat from running down their eyes. So we as priests, we first put it on our head 
and then we wrap it around our neck. So generally you always uh, kiss the cross first. Um, there's a little prayer that we say. Um, St. Paul talks about putting on the helmet of salvation. So we just touch the amethyst to our head, and then we put it around our neck. Now, doing this without a mirror, uh, I don't know what I'll look like at the end of this. <laughs> okay. The next thing that we wear is a very simple white garment. And um, this is, it kind of resembles what's called a soutan in the Middle East. It's just a very light garment um, that still today, uh, Middle Easterners in hot weather will wear this over um, their entire, uh, whatever other clothes they have on top. The spiritual reason for this is when you all are baptized, the church gave you a white garment and commanded that we bring this white garment unstained to the throne of the Father at the end of time. So it's called an owl. Priest wears it, deacons wear it, servers sometimes wear an owl. So it's just another image and symbol of our baptismal garment. Next thing we put on is called a cincture, uh, which just means belt. Um, the practical purpose is it keeps everything together. The spiritual purpose is St. Paul uh, says to um, uh, uh, put a belt around the loins of understanding. I don't know if I'm quoting that right, but. Next item is the stole, and the stole in uh, uh, Roman civilization was always, and in Judaism too, actually was always a sign of authority. So um, this is the authority of Christ placed over our shoulders. His yoke is easy, and his burden is light. And for the practical purpose, um, it shows who has been deputized. So an example of this is, um, you know, in the United States, we're a pretty free country, or at least we tell ourselves that. If you go to law school, you can see how many laws we have, and you ask yourself, are we free? How free are we? Um, you know, it's against the law to speed, but that doesn't give any of you the right to pull somebody over for speeding. Instead, you have to be deputized for that purpose. And the same is true in the church. Yeah, St. Paul says to confess your sins one to another, but you have to be deputized by the church in order hear those confessions. And the same with celebrating Mass or those other, some of those other sacraments. So this is the sign of the fact that we have been deputized by the church and to act in the person of Christ. Then the last item is called the chasuble. And in Latin, I think it's called the casula, which means house, um, because it's as big as a house. <laughs> um, it's a, a single garment, kind of a seamless garment, which should bring back images of Christ's arrest, um, of him wearing that seamless garment. Now, there is a difference, slight difference, in the way that a deacon will dress versus the way that a priest will dress. So how can you tell the difference between the priest and the deacon in terms of the stole? Do you remember? Yeah. So a priest will have his stole over both shoulders. A deacon will have his stole over just one shoulder. I think it's left to right. The second difference in the vestment is, for the priest, this is just one single garment. So there, there are no sleeves at all. So this is a chasuble. It has no sleeve. The deacon wears something that looks like it, but it's called a dalmatic. And the difference is the deacon has sleeves. So if you're ever in a church and you're not sure who the priest or the deacon is, one clue is to look at how they're Say something about the church.
liturgical colors? Yeah, liturgical colors. So, uh, we are on, um, the church is on a liturgical season every year. Um, it begins with the first Sunday of Advent, and it ends with the Solemnity of Christ the King, which happens in November. So, the church breaks down um, the seasons basically according to the life of Christ. So, we begin with the coming of Christ in Advent, and then we have the Christmas season. We enter into ordinary time a little bit. Then we have Lent, uh, preparing for Christ's uh, sacrifice um, on Calvary, and then we go back into ordinary time a well, each of these seasons uh, is given its own color. So how those colors were chosen, I, I honestly don't know. Um, but green is the color of ordinary time. So we are in the 18th week of ordinary time. Um, so we'll be in green for a while. Every now and then, if you go to a daily mass or sometimes a, a Sunday mass, you'll see a color different from green. That could be because it's a, a, a feast day. If a saint was martyred, then his color will always be red um, for martyrs. Um, if a saint wasn't martyred, then it's often white. White can be worn any day of the week of the year. Um, so I think that's a kind of a matter of convenience. You know, when priests have, have to travel so that you don't have to take three or four different vestments, you can always wear white and be okay. Um, but the standard color for ordinary time is green. So this is what we 